The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald. There he is. <sighs> Scott, you've never looked more beautiful to me. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in front of a gigantic TV set. I'm using the TV as a, as a face lighter. And I'm trying to get, get something besides green on here, but I can't. Let's see. I think I did this to you last time too, didn't I? I oh, I, I think I last time I was late, and then and then you you and Scott were working, and I came in. You guys were talking about Satan and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, this time I didn't even have a link, so I wasn't sure what was happening well, until I got your email just now, um, a few minutes ago. Anyway, so. If I'm understanding right now, as we speak, the the show one is live and going out, and uh, when well, it wraps up, we'll, this is, we'll this join the Q and A. This is really good that you actually asked for the clarification because <laughs> it kind of allow me to explain to uh, you know to the audience what's actually happening uh, with our recording. So we're playing a little bit of a catch up. So we're just going to have a nice easy. Um, start again recording today. Nothing else is going uh, on uh, concurrently, right? Nothing else tonight is happening. Oh. Okay. The, this this uh, is going to be recorded. It's the 25th of October. And then the fourth week of November, we'll record again and release tonight's episode at the same, at the same time. Okay. So, Wait, say, say that again. So tonight we are releasing the last episode that one's already released because somehow we missed a month there. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So somehow we ran through our month, so we're starting again, basically. Gotcha. I know. It, it's uh, There's our Scott. Um, it's been a crazy month for me, as you guys well know. But, oh, my God, I, I, I feel so uh, uh, unprofessional of, of all this. It's, it's Don't worry about it. That's why we put it at the end here and everything. And, and everything that you've done for the, you know, sharing it with your group and stuff. We do. We got over a thousand views on that first episode, and that's, oh, that's you awesome. know that's that's good. Yeah, we're twelve hundred views. So um, oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll yeah better about and, myself. Yes, people they love you, Dave. Right? Isn't, isn't that <laughs> they like me? They really like me. <laughs> really like I, I, I'm actually that that's that's really reassuring to hear because I felt so out of sorts uh, this month. So, all right. So, and again. Um, I feel like I used to be so clever, and yet somehow this all eludes me. Um, you, so the show that we recorded last time is yes. being shown right now. Next month. At the end okay. of next month. And because, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I keep missing what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> when we recorded, the first time we recorded, that one already aired, and that's the one where we have 1,200 views on. Right. Oh, okay. we had so there's sort of nothing, like a, nothing's coming out tonight. Nothing's coming out tonight. OK. All right. I, 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 I pimped out the wrong thing, I think. But um, so there's no We're light. Recording. There's not people watching our horrible, uh, awkward moment I now. I don't know. No, no. It's going. OK. All right. I feel better. And okay. I'll have a chance to cut it up and do all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And so we'll take out the breaks. And much of this actually states because it's. You know, I think like personally when, you know, I'm much more laissez-faire when it comes to the conversations. We're, yeah. we, we are all about just having a conversation. And, and, I, and I think that you give up something when you have an interview, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I, I've been, I've been uh, you know, we, we got to study rhetoric. We got to study how people uh, actually can connect. And when meaning is lost, uh, you know, you know, bad things happen, really. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. what, what I find is that there's um, and we you know, we can talk about the argument and, uh, you know, the position and everything um, that, you know, that you you defend. Um, yeah. But, you, you know, at the end of the day, if somebody's not, you know, willing to listen to you and if that doesn't mean come with the implied. Um, some it's, people think you're trying to convince them and it's like, right. wait a minute, I'm not trying to. I really wish we lived in a world where you had religion, where people understood that there's pretend world and then there's real <laughs> world. 
but that's but I'm not being mean though, right? right. It's actually, I feel mean? I feel bad for everybody who believes in religion in yeah. in that way because I can't say pretend without making that feel like it hurts their feelings. And or yet, it's completely wrong. And yet, that that weird balance between trying to be respectful to a person while challenging and being critical of the crazy nonsense delusion that they are under. Um, there's, so let's pause there's, there. Pause there for a minute. The crazy nonsense delusion, right? It, it, it's like I don't know how. It's been years since I've like blossomed out of this four horsemen sort of thing, right? Yeah. And it, it comes down to a choice. Do we want to be antagonistic with our speech, or as the, the road that I've tried to do is to say I want to offer an apology for mm. a consilience of sorts, right? This is. This there's a compatibility here, right? There's wisdom yeah. in the Bible. There's wisdom wisdom in the belief of Jesus. Okay, there is. I I I am, you know, I I admit yeah. that, right? Right. I so mean, let's talk yeah. about what that is. Right, and what kind of wisdom it is, also maybe, and you know, the 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 tension between the beliefs and scientific reality. The, the, the tension between belief and fact, you know. Um, there is a, well, also a, the, the fact that consciousness may be present in space and time outside of human nervous systems. And it could be the fact that consciousness is elemental and not just emergent. In which case, there'd be something like a proto-god at the foundation of things. It might be like a Tulu, but it would be something that's proto-subjective or quasi-conscious. And that might count as a god for some people if you want to say that there's that there's a spread consciousness stuff, just like there's a spread space matrix and a space temporal changing and there's neutrinos spread about and there's fields, right? There's field phenomena. So uh, who's to say there were actually zombies? I mean, Dennett thinks that we're zombies and consciousness doesn't exist. But like Galen Strawson says, nothing is more immediately obvious than consciousness. So it could well, be that consciousness is elemental, in, in which case there is a God. So it's saying that persons are completely... Are completely but, uh, um, False. That that first person don't exist. That, that may be an that may be an assumption. It, it may not be true that there are no persons. Well, I, I didn't say another thing. I really loved in response to uh, the free will arguments is we do have free will, but it's made up of tiny, tiny robots. And I always like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm normally like that. I think that it's a noble challenge to try to erase consciousness and free will and subjectivity and try to replace everything with Conway's life, you know, Conway's game of life. It's, it's, it's a grid of squares and a square is black or white. Have you seen this thing? Oh, this, this needs, I should have brought some kind of a link. Um, so you have a grid of squares and a square is either black or white. So, so let's say that white is empty and that black, we're using black paint. So black means on, okay? So if, if you throw a black on there so that it's on, the next time frame that thing will be will be black again if it has two or three neighbors. If right. it has less than two neighbors, it dies. It turns white. If it has more than three neighbors, it dies. But if that's square, and of course there's nine in a, in a grid, right? One, two, three. So we'll take a look in the middle. There's, there's three above, two to the sides, and three below, right? Three, three, three. Yeah. So the, if the one in the middle is black, it gets to be black in the next time slice if it has two or three neighbors only. That's the only rule. With yeah. that single rule, you can pepper a plane of a million squares with a random collection of, of black things, and some of them will congeal into self-reproducing organs that make children, that go out, that make spaceships, that fly mm, around. Mm, and the mm, only mm. rule is the one I just told you. A black gotcha. square gets to be black again in the next time frame if it has two or three neighbors, and that's it. Too many, then it, it and dies. From, thus from that rule, you get these negantropic self-reproducing systems. And so uh, that, when I saw that, I thought, the goal of science is to translate as much of human experience as possible to that, to absolutely personless, blind, dead, mechanical, meaningless, simple mathematical systems that are, that are recursive, finite, finitely statable rules and all that stuff, all that good stuff. So Hannah right. thinks that this, 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 this is awful because it, it's, 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 first of all, it's false. And second of all, it, it actually it cuts the human experience short. Mm -hmm. So now I'm getting all soft again, thinking that there is consciousness <laughs> and that values, there are real values. But a couple of weeks ago, I, I, was, I thought that the, the noble people 
kill subjectivity and prove zombiehood. And that's uh, just the weak idiots are the ones that think that there's consciousness and God and <laughs> meaning and values and, and, that, and that we shouldn't commit suicide. I mean, they have this stupid idea. So I'm, I'm, I'm slowly moving know. over to the non-suicide group now. <laughs> when I hear people reduce, you know, the fantasticness of existence and life to really simple things that just build on each other, for me, that's fantastic, amazing, and I'm filled with awe about that. The ability for just tiny little levers of probability. That's, right. that's, that's the, one, that's, that's the dream of the grand unified theory. I mean, the dream of the theory of everything is that we can state the whole cosmos, even the multiverses, the whole shebang, in something the size of E equals MC squared. Like they say, something that will fit on the back of a t-shirt. That is, that yeah. is, we love that idea. Yeah. And we love and it yet, so much that, we, that we we're willing to, we're willing to uh, delete ourselves and have ourselves digested into that thing. Well, see, this is the thing. This is where I, I disagree with that. It's like, for me, that's the amazing thing. That's the bootstraps of that. And what, just looking at the last, you know, X number of billion years of history, and we're a part of that, and it came from so simple a beginning, um, I just find wonder and, and, and grandeur in that. Um, it delights me. It delights me to see that. And it doesn't take away from all the wonders of, an average Saturday on, in, on planet Earth, you know, in your backyard or watching TV or just farting around, as, as Vonnegut says, um, it, it, it's, you know, it's it's where our universe came from. It's where our home came from. And we're a part of that. And I, I just find great joy in that. It doesn't threaten me at all. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple equivalencies that I want to I, I, I want to give you pervy to that that go through the the matrix that is is uh my cranium in a situation like that okay so when when i hear when i hear something that there's a um like you you love the 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 not the magic but just the the reality that you're aware that you're conscious in the way that you know you're conscious right yeah. like okay Absolutely. I, I agree i agree right and i think this is a very very something very very special now the 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 qualifier for all of this, my background knowledge on this is all supported by evolution and biology. But when I when I look back at, um, you know, the Hellenic tradition and I look at, 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 at Plato, it seems to me that the what he's mostly describing is our eusocial ability. Where does this stuff come from? Right. And, and then and then, you know, as secular, uh, progressive, modern day philosophers we say, well, that's the forms, that's this, we can discredit it, we can, whoa, 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 whoa. What's he describing that matches up with all of human history? We have this frontal cortex that has this ability to abstract like no other animal that we're aware of. I, I mean, yeah. and then and then use it in a way that we can produce things, okay? It, it, maybe produce things that are going to destroy us, but that is obvious, right? You could say that the, you know, the 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 whale has like more like fundamental computing power, but it, you know, it's stuck like this, right? I mean, that's kind of poking fun a bit, but it just, you know, there's there's something magic there, right? And so if I can say that if there not if there is a god, if I'm going to if I'm attuned to truth as an embodiment of God, right, okay, then the truth is the truth. That is the truth. There is no other truth, right? And that God has to believe in that. That God has to be that truth. And I think that's the pursuit that allows somebody to sharpen the pencil towards, and this is why I keep coming back to Plato, is because it's towards a common good, a survival of a, spe of a species. Right. There's um, uh, Brett Weinstein has been talking about thing called lineage selection, which is is really interesting. I really agree with how he's framing it because he's saying, hey, you know what? The kin selection guys and the group selection guys, they both don't know what they're talking about. Kin selection is too isolated and group selection just doesn't mathematically work. Right. So he's saying hmm. lineage because you're now you're talking about threads in culture right he's saying that 
it's about uh, it's like a lineage. So these fall under the same um, effects of, of of Darwinian uh, forces, right? This lineage sort of evolutionary thing. And uh, I've got to applaud him. I, it's it, you know my intuition says that that's you know sounds pretty good. The best I've heard. So I adopt mm. the theory. I adopt the theory, right? But you're still saying that the real determiner, the, the real determination, that the that the final cause of the whole thing is just increased offspring. Is that is that it? Yes, but I, you know, I've talked about uh, free will and myself. You're saying that there's different types of things that help the increase of offspring, and these yeah. things happen to be things that we call like use social will and all this stuff. Well, what you're saying is that all these spheres of meaning and value that are outside the that that you would think would be outside of, of evolutionary biology are in fact nothing but side effects of maximizing offspring is that correct yeah 100 percent bio, biological yeah uh it's epiphenomenal it's a it's a, now what i what i am saying is that you know, we can have an experience of color, right? Color is the most, uh, the, um, the studies in philosophy about color theory are the, the, are the go-to, uh, you know, um, I guess, experiments to, to understand this point. And that is like, what, is it, what's the, what does it mean to experience blue? Right, what, you know, what, what does it mean to experience that? We even have evidence where red means something and blue means something. Red means something more cautious than than blue does, right? There's the development of societies where you have only a few colors and then the maximum number of colors that are recognizable by, you know, even, even a few select populations around the world have, um, you know, a limited number of colors that they recognize. Like the ancient Greeks couldn't apparently see blue and yet we have such a a representation of the you know the the blue and the you know the the aegean seas and you know the mediterranean the rooftops and all this we have all this image in our head but you imagine a, a population that just didn't have that programming yet they just didn't they couldn't see it and so you know, I always wonder, like their psychology. Do you do they bl do they blend more into the into the into the um, into the earth and the surroundings? I think so, right? There's a grounding that is so so very fundamental to a, a Hellenic origin sort of story, right? Um, what else could I say? Uh, they're also orientated very much towards where the directions of the mountains are, hmm. right? You know, my my dad was like that. You know, I say well, it's west, and he'd look. You know, or he you know he'd get all to, he has to see where he was in relation to the mountains, right? I understand. I, I'm a genius. Go no, ahead. No, I was going to say in Hawaii, um, they don't have north, south, east, or west. They have towards the ocean, towards the mountain, <laughs> clockwise and counterclockwise, and they don't call it that. They say towards Diamond Head, away from Diamond Head. Uh, Well, I'm oh, gonna... one. okay. So uh, I, have a, I have a Christianity question. If that's okay. Yeah. So if uh, if Jesus was made whole cloth uh, of out of no historical kernel, if there was nothing happening actually in Israel at that time that could be the denotation of Jesus, that was a group or a person, uh, right? And this was entirely just a story entity. What story was right. it originally before it settled in and acquired its Jewishness? Um, well, I, I, I think it was it started with Mark. <clears throat> well, it, here's the thing. Mark is a watershed for a couple of different reasons, because Christianity before him is very different than Christianity after him. Um, before him, we've got early Christians who are talking about a celestial messiah a, a son of god like all these other mystery faiths like all these other demigods uh, but this Jew, in this jewish version they have his spirit speaking to them through the hebrew scriptures um and the book of hebrews describes something like that where they compare him to like melchizedek they compare him to 
uh, another Adam, another Joshua. Well, right. who, 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 who is the him? How are they conceiving of this him? Is this so like a Holy they, Ghost type? The savior thing? figure of their particular mystery faith. Is this a person or, or do they see it as like some kind of, a, of a well, some, archon? Some, some saw it as an archon. Some saw it as an angel. Some saw it as a, uh, you know, emanation from God, you know, the logical extension of him. Uh, uh, so was this entity ever I, embodied? Sorry. What was this entity that they're that they're honoring ever embodied in history as any per particular person? I don't believe so. I think he was a celestial figure and we see proto-Christian writings like the Ascension of Isaiah and they describe what they thought of as this figure who was moving through the seven heavens to make his way down to earth, but they didn't have any information about that. Um so Paul's Jesus, I mean, it's an open question whether he thought he was purely celestial or if he had made an appearance, but we had taken no notice of him because he didn't do any miracles. He didn't have any miraculous teachings. And this was all to fool the, 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 uh, um, the so, powers so of the air. So what's particular that, about this? So, so you would sorry? say that it's, uh, you would, so there are multiple early Christianities. Absolutely. That, there's multiple yeah. early Christianities. Yeah. Yeah. So what do they have in common? Um, they were, as far as I can tell, um, the further we go back, the more they look like the other Hellenistic mystery faiths, and they're all trying to yeah. compose a Jewish version for themselves um, yeah. in various ways. And, um, and, I, and I will tell you that from, a, from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, they, they, they physically, this is where the cross comes from. This is the intersection between Hellenism and Christianity. That's the whole point, the ground and then the pointing upwards. Mm. And, and it's not, and, and it's it, it, the, the amazing thing. This is like once the, the key unlocks and you realize this, you're like, well, the Orthodox Christian faith yeah. use this as universal history. And they're bringing in elements like things from Troy and they're bringing in elements like, uh, um, who was who is the emperor that started Christianity? Um, in Constantine. In Constantine, right? They're coming in, so they're they're trying to create this like, um, uh, it, it's not even synchronous with time, right? It's it's they're they're saying that these are like forces coming together for this intersection. Yeah, when I want to I want to just back up because I want to make sure I'm I'm agreeing with the right thing you're saying. Now, Constantine did not invent Christianity. No, no, I realize that. Yeah. Evolving all that. Okay, yeah. Um, but but the, yeah. everybody knows that these things are all coming together, and and yeah. and it it's because it's 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 like it's co it's like it's um it's making sense in so many different ways, right? I mean, it's got a tradition to you know um with with the Judaic tradition, it has a way to map onto their knowledge, right? Yeah. So even like well, the no, no, that, that's actually that, that's perfect, Daniel. That, that's my question. So were these early proto Christian groups? Greek Gnostics that were talking to Jews, or were these Jews who had heard about Greek Gnosticism and were coming up with something of their own? I get the feeling they were Hellenized Jews who were trying to tap into this uh, mystery faith phenomenon. Um, What's the hell? Then we had these are, these are Jews that are Jews, and they're absorbing greek religion which is a, an anti-jewish activity how are they coming to no 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 no. you guys you got this all kind of wrong honestly you guys really do so the hellenized version of the judaic tradition these really grew together because it's so ancient they really really grew together i mean so i wouldn't really think of them just as a distinct i think i i would add uh david that i think there was a dionysian um common sort of like nobody fits in this party sort of thing that was happening that's why it happened so organically that's why it's more ubiquitous throughout the rest of society it's not just this exclusive group of people right it, it became something i think oh, well, I'm, I'm talking about judaism as as judaism which is highly exclusive and and would say no to anything that wasn't jewish oh no that's I mean, what that, i'm that's, that's the jews were the most exclusive of, of all those uh groups in right, yes. but you got to remember also during the first century, Judaism is more more diverse than it ever had been before or since as well. And we had people like Philo of Alexandria who were deliberately setting out to combine 
Judaism and Hellenistic wisdom and philosophy. Quite explicitly, quite deliberately. But, yeah, but, and, yes. but how, so how were they held like Spinoza in contempt by the uh, Orthodox? Or, or the um, Orthodox people? I mean, we're, we're, I'm just wondering, here's a real question. So J Jews are highly ex exclusivistic and they would say no to bringing in any religious elements that, that were outside the Torah and the main books. And so I'm wondering, uh, were these, were these, so, so I'm wondering, were, did they distinguish, was there a distinction between prohibitions that were of one religious type and there were other things that we would think of being as religious that could be incorporated and say, yeah, we're, we're going to make a hybrid of these, like these uh, pagan, we're, we're, we're going to make a, a Jewish pagan hybrid, but that's okay. As long as you do this kind of thing. It, it, so was there, what, what, was, there was, well, that, was that the way it was? Let me, let me stop, there's, stop, there's stop, like, stop. Yeah. In a sense, I want to say, yes, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what they're doing. And we can see how this played out even in the New Testament, where you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Christians and the, the Baptist, John the Baptist cult. You can see all these tensions between them on who's being a Jew, who's not being a Jew, who's being the real Jew, who's being the new Jews and the old Jews. Um, all these things were playing out in the first century. And we see it. We see it on paper in Christianity, early Christianity. But the critic, the finger wagging is coming from people that, that are Jew Jews and they're saying you guys are, are, are outside. Well, are you got to remember too. Know? Also, what you're, what we call Jew Jews and Orthodox Jews, they are sister religion with, with Christianity, the Pharisees and then all these things after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, all the Jews were in just as much turmoil as the early Christians were. Um, and there was lots of overlap between those two groups. Um, so it's not like you can say all Jews were this monolithic thing that believed this. Th th that wasn't true in the first century. That simply was not true. Um, we had all kinds of uh, different um, communities of Jews and of Gentiles, and there was intermixtures and exclusivities and the whole spectrums of how well they got along with each other and interacted with each other's ideas. And, and I, I want you to think of the, the synthesis between uh, the Judaic faith and basically trying to eliminate Hellenism by the only way to do it is have it rebirth. That was the idea. And that was the point where you know, imagine a bunch of people. I just want to get this to kind of, you know, convey the point. You had a bunch of people sitting around in a circle and they're new recruits, okay, to the Jewish faith, okay? Oh. Um, they, they, they're sitting there saying, hey, you know, it'd be really great if we could offer more forgiveness and, you know, not so much rigidity on the rules. This is a real, real oversimplification, right? And then, then Scott's over there on the far side. He's got all the robes on, and his answer is, nope, ain't going to work. No, nope, ain't going to work. David and I go to our side, and we say, David, you know— it, this, this kind of sucks. Like, how can there be a God that won't give a forgiveness and love? I can feel it. I did something wrong with this, mm. right? There's something, yeah. there, that's why, what does it identify with? It has to be something so visceral that people identify with it, with their being, right? It's like, how yeah. can this be right? Right? And so, and, I, I and think they just morph together. This is, we're, mm. we're, we, we do that. We have so much fluidity between even different sects of, uh, of Christianity. And you think, well, where did they break? Where did they? It's all like the triune brain. There is no three levels or distinctions. There's no difference. Uh, it's just that we have a language that differs and makes them so that they're divided. But were, but were there really any people back then thinking consciously, all this shit is made up anyway. Let's make up some new shit and then pretend that it's found or given. I, see, I, I wonder about that. I wondered to the degree that they were aware that they were making this up as they went along. Um, Cause it's hard for me as a 21st century person looking back, not seeing them do that, you know, and for most religions, I feel that way too. Um, but one, one thing I feel like is getting lost is we're talking about Judaism. We're talking about Christianity as mm -hmm. though they were one thing. And yeah. this, all the things that we take for granted in Christianity, I mean, you get 50 different Christian groups in a row and they will tell you 50 different 
and things. But back then, even the stuff that we agree on as modern Christians, they didn't have down yet. Um, it was still every all these things were still getting hammered out. I mean, we've got letters from Paul talking to the Christians in Corinth saying, um, how come some of you say there's no such thing as resurrection of the dead? It's like, you know. Um, and, and on a secular side, we never got the, uh, you know, not the final writings, but we didn't have all the all of the writings by, you know, 1000, right, um, of, of Aristotle's stuff. So, I mean, to say, and Aristotle's throughout the church, right? That's yeah. mm. <laughs> on both accounts, right? Yeah. Old and new. Because yeah. there's an interpretive aspect to this as well, right? Okay. And so, so it's I guess we're saying that the the proto, the you know you know the, the, there's the proto orthodox Christianity that that's what Ermin calls the first original group, and that's kind of a common term. But so these proto proto Christian groups, you're saying may not have anything in common. So you might have a group over here that has had nothing like a Jesus, but they had a seal element that eventually got absorbed into the proto Orthodox Church. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that exactly because we we really don't know. The further we go back, though, the more gnarlier and wittier and the less it looks like anything we call Christianity looks like. Um, and just as a just as not an example of that, but just as a side note to that, if we didn't have the third century Nag Hammadi library, if we had not found that stash of of scrolls, we would have no idea that in third and fourth century um, Christians were saying the things that they say in those books that are just so bizarre and out there. Yeah, that's right. All we, had was, all we had was what Arrhenius and Valentinus and um, Origen, right? And 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 yeah, and the pseudo Dionysus or something. I can't remember who it was. But, but well, all those, was Tertullian, Tertullian, they're super anti Gnostic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and all the the heresy hunters, and it's like there's so many things we think we know about heretics that we only hear about through people like Irenaeus and Tertullian and Eusebius, and it's like we're only getting one side of this story. Um, and I think a perfect example of that is Docetism, the the so-called heretical belief that Jesus didn't really show up in physical form, but he was an illusion. Um, I increasingly think that's a straw man argument. And what they were really saying is that Jesus didn't exist full stop. He just did not come in the flesh, period. Um, well, not that's that he was some excellent point. That's an excellent but, point. Yeah, yeah. That's right. How, how can we say that it was a Jesus that wasn't an embodied one when Jesus is already post embodiment concept? All these things, all these things. That's right. And I, I kind of want to get back to your thing about Judaism and how exclusive it was. And it's like, yeah, Judaism has been like that now, but we we really don't have uh, we, we there's there's more evidence that Judaism was a lot more diverse in the first century and before that. Um, but wait, but isn't Yahweh super exclusive? Is, is he, isn't Yahweh the most exclusive deity in history? But here's the thing: the Jews didn't always worship Yahweh. If you look at the Old Testament. Yeah. It is dripping with other gods, and it is constantly retrofitting and retconning its own story to make it seem like Yahweh was there all along, and everything was, uh, you know, he was just the last god standing. Basically, <laughs> he was just the last god standing. The more we look into Yahweh's backstory, the more we see how he's connected to all the other Mesopotamian pantheon there, and how um, he's not just brothers with Baal. He's, he absorbed Baal. He absorbed El. He, all these things that yeah. they did in their uh, mythology winds up in the Old Testament as uh, Yahweh doing. Um, and in a lot of ways, Yahweh feels like a very much a Johnny-come-lately God in uh, he Hebrew history. We've got this whole collection of a century of correspondence from this Jewish mercenary colony in Egypt, in south of Egypt, uh, in the, or yeah, southern Egypt, uh, called Elephantine. Um, we have all these collections of letters that they were writing back and forth to Jerusalem and the temple, um, asking for their help. They were on very good terms with them. And just as little side notes, when we read those, we realize they don't seem to know anything about Moses or about Joshua or about where the Passover came from. Um, they have a temple in um, Egypt. I of, see. So it really is tribal and ethnic, just like they say today. 
Well, I mean, it, it's not that it's tribal or ethnic, but they've got everything. They're on good terms with the, the temple in Jerusalem. And that's weird because at this time, there's only supposed to be one temple, the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but the temple in Jerusalem has no problem with these guys. And in their temple, they worship Yahweh, only they call him Yahoo, and two other gods. <laughs> they have three gods that they worship there. Um from and three no one, down to one, back up to three again. What's the problem? <laughs> and, and, and none of the God, none of the uh, the Jews have any names that we recognize from any of the stories of Moses or Abraham or any of those things. Um, and this is in the fifth century. This is the fifth century um, uh, in the Hellenist, you know, uh, post uh, Babylonian period, uh, getting close to the Hellenistic period. Um, Very distinct ecosystem of religion. Uh, but here's know. the thing. It's not like this is some kind of land that time forgot, which is what I kind of always assumed to until I realized these guys knew each other. They were in correspondence with each other. They weren't some kind of heretics. They weren't some kind of, you know, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs lost uh, tribe thing. They were part of the, the of the mainstream. And it's just it's just that they've preserved that. That's what was happening in the fifth century. Um, you know, so it looks like it looks like Jewishness and and uh, like religious homogeneity are were are, are separate then. Right. That's the lesson. I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But what I am saying is it seems like what we think of as venerable long term Judaism is not as old as we thought it uh, was. And right. uh, but this, people, you said fifth century is that B.C.? BC, yeah, fifth century BC. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah. Rather than a thousand BC or seven hundred BC, you know, um, it's hundreds and hundreds of years. For me, it just blows my mind uh, that I um, see because by that time everything should have been settled and and exactly. or, or orthodox meaning should have been established. Exactly, and yet it seems the opposite is true. It seems like all this coming uh, that this Yahweh exclusivity all came from after the Babylonian period when they came back from Babylon and were trying to retrocon this backstory for Yahweh that never existed in actuality. Um, I think the, the more they suffered and the more exiles they experienced, the more they thought, this is because we haven't settled on a belief. We know how Yahweh is so anxious about, mm -hmm. about belief. But like, like belief is like the, the blood that Yahweh lives off. It's like his vampire. It's like this food. So I think that I thought, look, yeah. we need to have we need to have one meaning and one interpretation, and I think the plurality of interpretations is pissing them off because if, if if there's something that's actually true that he wants it, he wants our thinking to be right. It's, it's just I just wonder if yeah. if, if there's because I I know I have friends that have gone to prison, and for them they thought that the reason they're there is not because they did this or that crime, it's because they didn't believe in Yahweh the right way. Like like people that have cancer that aren't fixed, it's not because the, the cancer is not fixable, it's because they didn't have the right kind of faith. So, so during yeah. the crisis, you wonder if you could tune your believing and your thinking in such a way to please the sadistic piece of shit that's making you sick. <laughs> so, so I wonder if, 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 if that's something we're having. It's like, it's like, he's pissed off. He's pissed, what are we doing wrong? We killed this. We killed that. Maybe it's the stories that we tell. Maybe actually it was two apples instead of one or something like this. And, and the, if we're fucking up the belief, then we're pissing him off because he, he can read our minds. We're like, oh, shit, that, that's the one last thing we need to do. We need to start pruning our thoughts. Yeah, yeah, he really liked that. He liked that. <laughs> We could do hey, a David, whole show. David, David, ask, 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 yeah. ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That say that's number um, like uh, rant number two for Scott. That, they're okay. impressive, aren't they? Once he gets on a roll, <laughs> he gets this. Uh, you know, he gets this because, idea. You know, it, there, there, there's there's <laughs> sacrifice as part of an economic relationship with the god. You give the god something, and he gives you in the Aryan Judaic and all, all the the life affirming religions. It's an economic relationship. More children, mm. more health, more wives. Yeah. A victory in war, not yeah. not plagues, good fresh water, all this all this stuff. So you're you're getting benefits by 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 exchanging. And then when bad things happen, then you think, how do we upset the alpha? Because it's it's a yeah. sky alpha. Oh, actually, here's the only thing I wanted to say this evening. Okay, uh, are, are you familiar with, with with the um the uh the chimpanzees response to thunder? Did we talk about this? No, no, no. no. This is currently the most important fact in in the biology of religion. So it turns out that. When chimps hear thunder, they look up at the sky, and they and then they look around to see if they can find any garbage can lid or anything loud, and then they bang them and they shake their fists at the sky. 
Ha. So when, when, when the Bible talks about having fear of God and God wants you to, to fear, respect, and love him, this that the cringing that monkeys feel, including us, when we hear thunder, and you know, Yahweh mm-hmm. was originally a, a meteorological god, just like Bayou and all the the uh, in the um the so-called Hindu yeah. gods, the Aryan gods. So yeah, they're all meteorological. Before you have celestial, they're, they're meteorological. So yep. it's so obvious. So even yeah. chimps have God, they have the same God we do. He's a jealous, angry God, and he wants fear. So a big so chimp in god the sky. You can either yeah. say, fuck you, or you can say, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But those are the two things you could do to an alpha. And and so so Yahweh actually is the best, most honest report about the true God, which is our genetic response to thunder. I love that. Very good one. Very good one. Yeah, Very yeah. Good one. Very good and when one. you so think about it. Is, I mean, thunder is more important to um to God than we realize. It's like the, yeah. the thunder is the essence of God. Actually, the real essence, meaning real means excremental. So thunder uh, is the real essence of God. I could not agree with you more. And when you think about it, it's like these clouds, these thunder, they bring lightning or they bring life giving rain. It's, you know, depending on how well right, things are right. going. That's a good point. That's a good point. It's like, yeah. and, and, and think about this too. We look up in the sky and we see a cloud and we think, wow, that's gorgeous. It looks like a unicorn. It looks like a dragon. Those guys looked up the cloud. They saw their God. Up there, there. That's yes, I, yes. The clouds were like a mood ring. They were Yahweh's yeah. mood ring. Yeah, um, yeah. And when the rain came, when the the lightning bolts came, that boom, they could see their God doing it. You know, um, there is a. We could talk a, a whole episode about the different evolutionary stages of world religions um, that Robert Wright lays out in his book, The Evolution of God, and it tracks so beautifully with the way uh we've been talking about the old testament and 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 the history of judaism um that's and, perfect so I'll, I'll make the judgment call right now we'll uh we'll load that book up and we'll we'll sequence we'll sequentially go through the you know the chapters as you suggest uh for the next episode which we will record a month from now and once a month so that sounds like a very good use of use of our time you you okay with that scott yes yes uh, david was in the middle of something weren't you um i think i was about to go uh, add on to that say uh russell gomerican has made some interesting uh points about how the the yahweh exclusivism um that came out of of that babylonian period um has some very interesting ties to the um uh, the Assyrians um, who came after the Babylonians. Um, and it's very interesting to see the connections on how, oh, this new religion of the Hebrews, that works really well for Assyrian interests as well at the time. So it totally clocks both with what was happening in the Middle East at that time and the near, Middle Near East and with this whole idea of when you're at certain stages from tribal to shamanistic to chieftain to early city state to empire you see what what is needed in a religion and those religions have a way of just forming um almost mathematically um the theology Wait, changes so you're saying there was a chain well i was going to say you're, the you're theology is always change. different but the structure is very very similar Right. We, we, so, d- did you just say that there's a ch- a change in Assyrian mythology led no, 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 to no, the no. increased uh, exclusivity in Judaism? No, but the the exclusivity of Judaism and the way they portray, for instance, David and Solomon and Yahweh, um, and the way we worship him, suits very well the Assyrian Empire's political interests at that time, and we can talk about that more later um but it's so the assyrian the assyrian political structure seeped into jewish myth making bingo bingo exactly and specifically into yahwehism um if you like yeah absolutely i see well that makes sense because if if the if you're under someone's political power then your concept of power comes from that system so that'll end up being your like your axioms for your myth making Okay, so this one uh, comment comes from uh, John Nayrich. If we look at the main characters in modern fiction, we often find the author based 
his or her protagonist on a real person. But it isn't based on their actions, etc. It is their character. Sherlock Holmes is based on Dr. Joseph Bell, Conan, Do- or Conan Doyle's mentor in medical school. Uh, uh-huh. Not not a detective, even. <laughs> um, Miss Marple and Vera are based on the different author's elderly relative. Children's stories like Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan get their first name from an actual child. The author knew, but not the surname and certainly not the storyline. I want to pause and insert and say we can make, communities can make a shared story. Sure. Right? Once it starts to, you know, then it has to congeal and make sense. Anyways, in none of these cases, the reference to a real person is so tenuous that we don't consider there was historical homes, Marple, Stanpole, Pan, etc. Right. Why the emphasis, right? Even the well, fact that we get in these, you know, dialectical arguments in it, it's the wrong, it's, it's, it, you know, it's kind of like a, a perverse argument, right? Well, it's, I feel, I feel like that, that, that temptation to say there was a kernel of truth at, behind Robin Hood and King Arthur and all that, th- those are very deep rooted for whatever psychological reason. Um, and, and Mark definitely had his own, um, uh, uh, sources, a, not sources, but his own influences and his own inspirations. But for the a, most part, there is something right they, here where I don't know if you oh, can read ahead, it, but he says it go goes on to talk about Mark. So here, let me read. Yeah. Let me read. So, in the sure. case of Mark, he apparently started with the same <laughs> mythical celestial Jesus that was killed and rose again, as Paul was writing about. Yeah. Did he have access to Paul's letters themselves, or was he just aware of this one sex beliefs? Um, I, um, I'm I'm very confident he had uh, that all the evangelists had uh, access to to Paul's letters. Okay, and he says I do think he took the name of Peter and James from early leaders of the church, but personally, I think he recast them in different roles. For sure, this is absolutely true. Paul's totally Peter agree. may have been a successful Jewish businessman, and Mark got a kick out of casting him as a lowly fisherman. He <laughs> may have purposely kept Paul out as Paul was a bully know-it-all and laughed about having his Jesus give the keys to the kingdom to his Peter. Okay. Um, <laughs> he, he goes on. He goes on. That's what I said. I want. Uh, yeah. So Mark started with the name of his main character and with – the climactic finish he he may have he may have known some charismatic itinerant preacher but this guy may or may not have been named some variant of jesus and he needn't have been crucified paul may have been based the circ on the circumstanced or paul may have even based the circumstance of jesus in terms of his ministry on what he had heard of John the Baptist, who seems to have been a real person. Uh, let me stop you there because we're getting really talking about missing points. Let me stop you there real fast. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yes, John the Baptist was definitely a, his movement was definitely a rival of early Christianity. Um, I don't know how much John the Baptist cult influenced um, Paul. Um, but he, Paul was definitely aware of people like, uh, Apollonius of uh, Alexandria, um, who were obviously f- just from what the clues we read in, in the new Testament, they, he was a follower of John the Baptist, um, whether John the Baptist was an actual real person. Um, I tend to be agnostic about that. If I was going to put money, I would put more money on John the Baptist being a real person than Jesus, for instance. Um, yeah. But it wouldn't shock me if John the Baptist was also um, uh, a fictional founder figure. Um, but that said, I do. I think there's better reason to think that John the Baptist uh, was real. Um, I mean, definitely his cult was real. Um, and uh, I think the fact that John the Baptist shows up in all four of our Gospels um, is one of the best reasons we can think that um uh, that he might have been a real person, uh, but again, 
like it, that's it's all circumstantial really um yeah but why why would anyone have jesus be baptized by a superior if they didn't need to do that. That's the thing. Mark didn't see him as being baptized by a superior. All the go- the evangelists had their own different idea of who Jesus was and what Jesus was. So for Mark, his Jesus was just an ordinary human guy who just obeyed God so well that at his baptism, God adopted him as his son, and he was kept obedient all the way through the, his testing, the 40 days in the desert, all the way through his ministry, all the way through when he realizes that what God is asking him to do in the Garden of Gethsemane and that it's going to be horrible and he's going to die. And then after that, because he's uh, been faithful unto death, God raises him and brings him up as his son in heaven. That's not John's Jesus. John's Jesus is God right out of the box. He was God from the creation of the universe, and he doesn't care who knows it. And it's a wonder that he wasn't stoned for blasphemy right out of the gate five minutes into his, his book, because they could not be more diametrically opposite, those two Jesuses. Um, yeah, and it's worth noting that John the Baptist is different in every single gospel as well, from perfect stranger to a second first cousin um, in the case of and, John. So I've always wondered this, you know, the church fathers and the ones that you know, we're at the right time and the right moment to be able to help codify, you know, what the actual, you know, New Testament, how it was released. You think, well, okay, we're going to put this one with this one, with this one, with this one, you know, we're going to arrange it this way. And I I somehow think that sometimes the contradictions that you have outlined, the battles between and the contradictions that are made apparent are some, uh, you know, were thought out, were considered, right? Uh, and, yeah. you know, I mean, maybe that's giving more credit than it's due, but, you know, the the the, the claim is that the Bible is a complicated document with thousands and millions of internal references and things yes. that, you know, you, you, you know, we, we can't simply get from a, uh, I mean, at least this is the charge anyways from from, you know, the religious side that that a secular yeah. scientific, you know, from, you know, from, you know, the buildup of, of tiny little molecules into something, you know, grand. It doesn't work that way. You can't you can't do it. It has to come down from, uh, you know, some sort of pattern that's not based on 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 science. Right. Just, right. And it, I mean, it's to an extent they're true, it's, it's true because. A secular person looks at the the Bible and they can see things that a religious person can't see um, and vice versa. But I think the truer picture, having been on both sides of that equation, I feel like the truer picture is definitely on the secular side. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, you know what? Let me back up this a smidge. I keep doing this. I'm sorry, but all this talk about John the Baptist makes me want to bring up one other interesting point. And it kind of dovetails back to what we're talking about. This was there a kernel of truth at the at the base of of the story? Um, Robert Price wrote an essay that the first time I read it, I just thought it was ridiculous. And then that the more I thought about, it, the more and more it's intrigued me ever since. And he suggested he wasn't trying to prove anything, but he suggested, you know, we know these gospels are myths about Jesus. We know these Gospels are allegories. Is it possible that our Gospels are allegories about John the Baptist? And what we call Jesus, i.e. the Savior, is actually talking about John the Baptist. Um, And we'll never know for sure, but there's some really fascinating ramifications of of trying to puzzle it out that way. you know what? And let's not get your uh, don't kid yourself. I think there's religious, um, you know, colleges and universities that really, really look at this and look at the evidence because, yeah. you know, there are religious, um, you know, studies in almost every humanities department of every university on, on yeah. around the world. Right. I mean, this stuff well, is I, studied. Well, I, I guess the first the first problem with that would be that why would they mention John the Baptist specifically as John the Baptist if if they if they were all about John the Baptist? Why would he appear as a third person in his own story? This is the same argument they use about the Son of Man. 
Jesus, of course, wasn't the son of man because he refers to the son of man in the third person. And you don't do that. Jesus knows how to use the pronoun I. That's evidence that he's not the son of man. Right. right. So, like I said, so, so, so the gospel just... refer to John the Baptist as John the Baptist. And they wouldn't use Jesus for the for all the other stuff if it wasn't him. Why why would they double it? Well, he's he suggests that they're doing this that it started with Mark, and Mark did this because John the Baptist was a real person and Jesus wasn't, and they made this story. Um and th- there's some really interesting clues that he's giving winks to the audience that he's doing that. Now, I'm not, like I said, I'm not signed on board with that, but I'm fascinated by the way he makes that add up. And like, for instance, all the people, the mythicists out there who say that, oh, the Gospels were invented by Flavius Josephus or the Romans, um, their their theory to me fails even worse than the John the Baptist theory. Um, yeah, anyway. So it says the all important crucifixion could not have happened in the way that Mark and the others tell it. So it seems to bear little resemblance to some actual guy's demise. Absolutely. Um, Then Mark spins his tale on modernized fables from the Old Testament with a few Greek legends thrown in. What I've seen of the thorough study of the Gospels these writers seem to have only a passing knowledge of the Holy Land and get things wrong or off kilter. Definitely. Wait, 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 before, before we analyze all that, yeah. we go in order. And because I, I'm actually not familiar with the first part. So wh- why is the crucifixion account so bad? Uh, because from historically, everything about his passion story, his arrest, his trial and execution None of it matches what we know about first century Jewish law um, or even about Jewish customs. Nothing, none of it could have happened the way it's presented in Mark's gospel and by extension, all the other gospels. Um, it just makes no sense. And I've got whole chapters uh, in Nailed and in Jesus Smithing in Action talking about all the ways. <laughs> what are the top five least likely um, to have actually I mean, happened? Well, for instance, Whoever wrote the trial sequence obviously had never been to a Jewish trial because they make all these crazy mistakes that just are unhistorical. For instance, the high priest acting as the prosecutor in the trial, that's wrong, first of all, because Jewish trials don't have prosecutors. The high priest couldn't, nothing Jesus did qualified as blasphemy under Jewish law. If it had been Jewish law, and he was convicted of blasphemy, they would have just stoned him to death as the law required. Uh, the fact that all this happened on the eve of Passover meant that they should have been home preparing for Passover for all these different ways, and they should have just delayed his trial for the weekend and had it afterwards. The the Jewish scholars have just laid out how just point after point after point after point, none of this makes sense. Um, the, Did the they do that thing where they let the audience choose to let someone go? Would that ever yeah, actually they, thing? That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Christians have struggled to find any kind of historical corroboration for this uh, Privilegium Pascal that Pontius Pilate did because he was such a nice guy, the Jews. Um, the portrayal of Pontius Pilate makes no sense compared to what we know from what everybody said about him uh, uh, in uh, contemporary records. Um, nothing in that trial makes sense. And yet, when you look at everything, especially the, the Barabbas uh, sequence that you mentioned, Scott, that uh, per- point in particular makes perfect sense point by point by point by point as an allegory for Yom Kippur makes no sense at all um, historically, logically, um, realistically. But as a metaphor, boom. And that in that pattern repeats itself from the beginning of Jesus's career to his death, everything in between. You can see where they're taking this motif, this illusion, this midrash, and turning it into a Jesus story. Um, and we even have church fathers like Origen who explicitly say that. It says, you know, when you read the Gospels here, if you try to read them literally, they make no sense. That's just crazy. You have to read them symbolically and metaphorically yep. so, so the other the other texts that were being uh, passed around by non-jesus miracle working sons of god did they include 
these allegorical embodiments of Jewish myth, or was the or were the Jesus collection more filled with those type of uh, things than the Apollonius of Tiana type stories? Well, I mean, we for instance, like Mithras, um, we know his story dealt with these astronomical phenomena called the procession of equinoxes, and all the um, the little details in his story and his twelve followers. They all have astronomical slash astrological cognates to them. Um, and we see that in Jesus' story too. Were there other, you were saying, were there other Jewish people doing you, this? You, you were saying that, that, that m- many or most of the little stories in the Jewish, in the Jesus adventures yeah. are allegorical embodiments of, 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 of Jewish lessons or Bible lessons or, or Midrash right. or Talmud. Or, 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 right, sorry, no. right. Lesson, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But exactly. some, I'm saying were other were were other uh, miracle workers. Did they also have such a high percentage of allegorical Jewish myth content, or were they um, full of other type stuff? Maybe John the Baptist. I don't know. Um, as far as we know, as far as the Jewish ones know, I'm only aware of things that were directly connected to Jesus. Um, I don't know how many other um, quasi Jesus, proto Jesus. Jewish Christianity hybrids there were at the time, and maybe we'll never know that. Um, but it sure seems like there were lots of people trying to make sense of this um, from a blending of a Jewish and a Gentile uh, perspective. Guys, it just it just makes sense that there's a whole bunch, and then it, it congeals. I mean, that happened yeah. with the Greeks. You know, it didn't they didn't emerge all out of Athens. You know, it it it, it emerged fragmented, and then it it unified under a, a you know under an ideology, I guess. Right. Yeah. And even and what so we I think, think is like, oh. let's try and do it again. You know, we have yeah. to. You know, um, we we have to shape this form in 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 the in the in the way that we think is the best for us, right? Yeah. I mean, this is after the, you know, this is uh, as Rome is, you know, a little bit uh, spiritually deficient, right? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that said, we've also recently been uncovering connections between not just you know Zoroastrianism and Mesopotamianism in the Old Testament, but Greek and Egyptian and Babylonian influences, um, influence that are coming from a much later period than we suspect. Um, and even the fact that there are 12 tribes of Israel, um, uh, again, Russell Gamerkin has been uh, showing how that's a direct uh, influence of Plato and Homer and um, uh, these kind of connections are coming much later right. in the, in the, time frame than we were normally used to thinking for Judaism. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. What are you thinking, Scott? We're kind of getting close to the end of the episode today, I think. But you gotta, you gotta speak up, man. You know, you just, your voice, you gotta, <laughs> you just, your voice, you gotta speak up. Yeah. You know, the, 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 you just tell, you, tell you, Scott, you gotta speak up, man. Come on, speak up. This is a wallflower. Going to be something like, uh, was was Jesus? Uh, I don't know. So you have, you have multiple Jesuses, and the one that won out was this was a uh, kind of a, an atoning death rebirth God. Uh, but was it were the original Jesuses mostly uh, resurrection type gods, or were the other things and the resurrection thing only kicked in a bit later? Or was well, we've a, got evidence. We've got evidence that some of them were thought of as angels. Some of them were thought of as a, what's the word, hypostasis um, of, of Yahweh. Um, there's, I, it, I, the more we try to say that early Christianity was one thing, the more we, it's slippery and slips out of our hands. Scott, here's, here's where I, I would go with, um, it, it's this idea of um, Heidegger's theology, right? What resonates with people? So here you've got, you know, the direction of mankind's culture forming in front of your eyes, which which one resonates the most with the group is actually the direction in which we go. Bound right. by that right. kind of thinking. Okay, so, yeah, right? I, I knew there, there, I know there's multiple streams coming in, but I'm wondering if all those streams had one thing in common 
or whether the one thing was stamped on later and the original streams had could, some of them could have, not, could have had nothing in common, but they later became parts of the future Jesus. Uh, Scott, I suspect that that second one is the case, that they were all these different things and gradually over time, they've gotten crunched down and put into a more or less, you know, ramified framework where, okay, this is Christianity, this is not Christianity, this is heretical, this is not, you know, and and that process has been going on, you know, went on for hundreds of years. And when it was done, they would retrofit their scriptures to make it seem like it had always been that way. Um, There's another fact of our, our, well, even, even just looking at our, our existing new Testament texts, um, no two new Testament texts agree 100%. And I'm not just talking about, uh, Spelling and grammar mistakes because that's not special. Um, we were, got, were, were there we've other got, texts from, from non Christian groups that had, had Jesus? No, 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 no. no. These are characters. Christian groups. These are the same Christian texts that we have. But what I'm saying is, we've got versions of Matthew or we've got versions of Paul's letter here. Um, and we have opposite versions where one faction is clearly pushing for this, another faction is clearly pushing for that. And even devout Bible believing scholars are not quite sure which is the original or if we have any way of ever being able to tell which was the original uh, writing and which was the right. changed right. writing. Well, here's, here's my last question. So yeah. uh, were there were there similar stories uh, going around at the time of other Jewish miracle workers or, or that still survive? Because I know that there were Greek miracle workers that were like Jesus that shared many of his stories. Sure. Or were there other Jewish versions of Jesus? At, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I'm not sure. I would suppose that John the Baptist would count as one of those Jewish versions of the Messiah. We have lots of secular messiahs or at least um, messianic figures um, that were more political in nature, more revolutionary in nature. Um as it's, it seems to be anyway. But, 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 yeah, but, but, but were there other avatar type Messiah stories from that time yeah. that we still have? I don't know that, I don't I, know I, I, that we have I evidence to support that. that. Yeah. I, I had a kind of a, I had a, um, a, a hypothesis about that. And, and yeah. basically it, it, it kind of goes like this. If you had more of a homogenic, like a homogeneic sort of um, state, the average person, you have to think like we can we can digest the Bible because we we are literate. We know how to read. We're, we, you know, we're able to put this into our like um, into our metaphysics, even if it yeah. is just individual. I can really suspend it. I can I can put the cosmology in there. I can understand the stories. But, you know, in, in its early forms, even like, you know, at, you know, with with a plurality of Christianities kind of bubbling up with the mixture of Hellenic and all these kinds of things, right? Yeah. It's like, how do we order that? Okay, and the people writing the cosmology are doing what? They're taking it from places like Aristotle, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the Hellenic traditions and this and that. But who's doing it? It's the smart people in the in the tribe, right? Yeah. It's the smart people. It's the clergy. It's the people. Let's just say, arguably, it's like you and I. Right. Where, you know, the average guy on the streets going, I don't give a shit about that. I go, I show and I, you know, go to church and I sing and yeah. look, I bring up I singing stories. I like the stories. Reason. Yeah. They didn't sit and read. They don't have it. Yeah, come on, guys. Literacy wasn't yeah. even in yeah. the yeah. mindset. Yeah. All it was is, of, uh, you know, what was vocally, you know, about, you know, that's that's how it was transmitted. And so yeah. you can have a whole bunch of folklore stories some progressive some new all talking about something that makes these are really popular these ones here <laughs> right like yeah that's yeah that story is kind of like the and and the other aspect to it is it, it, it's popular but it's also boring a lot of traditions from say um you know the dionysian tribe or this one or that one and yeah. it, it I, I i think it seems so apparent to me that <laughs> You know, that, you know, until we talk about it in an honest way, you can't, you know, I mean, I guess you have to go and find evidence for it. But, you know, I think that framing it that way gives a particular insight. So if you need a new narrative, look at that one and say, does it match? Does it does it it, does it suit the other circumstantial evidence, you know, better than, you know, perhaps we've been understanding it. And I think that's a valid investigation, I think. 
on that note, David, my friend, until next month. Scott Heffler, until next month. Actually, we meet on more than one occasion, but guys, it's been a pleasure and thanks a lot. <laughs> Good night. The Myth of Jesus with David Fitzgerald.